When we go back uh, about 3.6 billion years ago, the only cells around were single-celled organisms that looked a lot like this bacteria. It would take another 1.5 billion years for cells like the animal cell we talked about in a previous episode to emerge. But understanding how these different kinds of cells emerged helps us to understand the similarities and differences between different types of cells. So let's start with a bacterium. Bacteria are prokaryotes, which are single-celled and relatively simple in design. Unlike fancy pants eukaryotes, whose cells are complex and band together to form multicellular organisms. But we'll get there in another billion years or so. Let's think, what would an ancient bacterium need to be able to live a full and happy life in a pretty hostile world? First, it's a good idea if it keeps its insides insides and its outsides outside. This division between insides and outsides in this bacterium and all other cells is the function of the plasma membrane. But bacteria also have a capsule and the option of a cell wall, which provides them with additional protection because bacteria can be found in some funky environments. Prokaryotes also need genetic material to encode instructions for how to build and repair themselves. This material is a bit different than yours and mine because it's not held within a nucleus. In fact, prokaryotes don't have any membrane-bound organelles. Instead, the genetic material, specifically DNA, is in a region called the nucleoid and is able to float freely. In order to be able to make things from this DNA, bacterial cells need ribosomes. Like the nucleoid, ribosomes are freely floating within the bacterium. Speaking of freely floating, being a single-celled organism, the bacterium might want to be able to move around its environment. This is why it may have a flagellum. Some bacteria interact with their environment by sticking to surfaces and moving along them with hairy projections called fimbrae or pili. These fimbrae and pili aren't just for sticking to things within the environment. They can also help the bacteria interact with each other and even make more bacteria, which is pretty exciting if you're a bacterium. How does this happen? Well, when one bacterium loves another bacterium very much, they can undergo a sort of sexual reproduction called bacterial conjugation. During this process, they combine genetic forces by exchanging small circular pieces of DNA called plasmids that contain a much smaller number of genes in the big pile over here. These plasmids are stable and able to undergo transcription and translation without the rest of the genetic material. And often, they have genes for things that give a competitive advantage, like antibiotic resistance. How's that for a romantic gesture? Let's take a pause. What are the structures we'd find in our ancient bacterium? It has genetic material in the form of DNA and plasmids. It has ribosomes to make the DNA and plasmids into proteins. It has a cell membrane to separate its insides from its outsides and a capsule and maybe a cell wall for some extra protection. And since it's a single celled organism, it's going to want to move around. So it has a flagellum, cilia, and pili. Now that we've met the first player in our story, let's move forward in time. All of the cells are prokaryotes, but that does not mean that they're all alike. One of the big differences is where these bacteria got their energy. A group of them called cyanobacteria were photosynthetic, able to convert light to energy. Some of them were aerobic, able to use oxygen to make energy, and some of them got their energy from eating the others. So one of the bacteria eaters eats some of the aerobic bacteria like normal, but this time it doesn't digest them completely. They become a symbiont, providing benefit for the host. In this case, the engulfed bacterium is creating the energy needed by the one that ate it. This means that the engulfing bacteria now have their own internal battery. We believe that that original aerobic bacterium is the ancestor of the modern day mitochondrion. So what about the photosynthetic bacterium? Well, that one similarly was engulfed and put to work in its host, creating the first chloroplast. This may seem far-fetched, but this is the basis for endosymbiotic theory or the theory that mitochondria and chloroplasts are the undigested remnants of the aerobic bacteria and photosynthetic bacteria. 
If this is true, we would expect that chloroplasts and mitochondria have a similar structure to a bacterium, and they do. They have circular DNA plasmids, their own ribosomes, they divide like bacteria, and their genes look like bacterial genes. Okay, what comes next? With complexity comes size, and with size, well, cells had to protect their assets. This led to the formation of a membrane around the nucleus called the nuclear envelope, which protects the DNA. Separating the DNA from the ribosomes keeps the ribosomes from transcribing whenever they please. And this means the DNA is able to change shape too, becoming the more linear shape we know and love. As the cell grew and gained complexity, because the cell was bigger, a greater cytoskeleton was needed to move things around. Pockets of membrane kept folding inward and creating membrane-bound organelles. This compartmentalization led to specialization. Basically, if you have a house with a bunch of rooms in it, you can split them up into a bedroom, bathroom, kitchen, etc. In a similar way, some pockets were filled with enzymes, creating the lysosomes and peroxisomes in both animal and plant cells. And there needed to be a place to make these enzymes and adapt them. This led to the creation of the rough endoplasmic reticulum. And since these new organelles were surrounded with membrane, they needed a way to make that too, which led to the creation of the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. At this point, that single cellular organism has given rise to two different kinds of cells, a photosynthetic cell and an aerobic cell. Pause the video and see if you can think of three things that they have in common. Welcome back. Could you think of three things they had in common? Here's what we came up with. They both needed something to produce energy. This would become the chloroplast in plant cells and the mitochondrion in plant and animal cells. Since they were more complex, they needed a cytoskeleton to move stuff around. They both needed a nuclear envelope to protect their complex DNA. They both have an endoplasmic reticulum to create cell membranes. And they both needed lysosomes and peroxisomes to break down wastes. However, since we're talking about two different lineages, the animal cell and the plant cell, things didn't always happen in the same way. That means that there are differences between these cells beyond the chloroplast and the mitochondrion. Since we already talked about animal cells in a previous episode, and we'll link to it at the end of this video, we're going to focus on the origins of the structures within the plant cell. Remember how our bacterial cells sometimes had an additional cell wall for environmental protection? Plant cells have one as well. Plant cells developed a cell wall because, unlike animal cells, they can't move from place to place and they needed to be able to withstand a wide variety of weather conditions. The plant cell wall is made of cellulose, which is basically a long chain of glucose molecules. It surrounds the plasma membrane and protects the inside of the cell. It's rigid enough to provide some structure for the plant. If we look at this model of a stem, you can see it's basically made up of cells which look and act like bricks. The cell wall helps to keep the water levels within these cells constant. And because when making a multicellular structure, the cells within the structure may want to communicate, the cell wall has channels called plasmodesmata that allows them to pass substances between cells, like passing notes in class. Part of maintaining structure in changing environmental conditions when you're essentially a bag of water is to have a central vacuole, which can gain or lose water in a way that keeps pressure inside of the cell constant. So now that we have more complex organelles in the cells, they needed a way to traffic their products and wastes around. This is where our favorite cellular postal service comes in. The Golgi complex is present in both plant and animal cells, and in both plant and animal cells, it packages and ships things to their destinations. In plant cells, however, it has an additional function. Since plant cells have a cell wall, there needed to be a way to make that structure. This happens in the Golgi. This means it can make the cell wall in-house and it already has the infrastructure to traffic it where it needs to go. Okay, now let's see what you've learned. In this chart, fill in yes, no, or sometimes to indicate whether or not the cell has that structure. For example, everyone has DNA, so you'd fill in yes for all three cell types. Now, pause the video and fill in the rest of the chart on your own. When you're done, press play to see how you did. Welcome back. Let's go through it together. 
In the category of genetic material, everyone has some. Some have additional genetic material, like bacterial plasmids. They all need a way to turn this genetic material into useful stuff, so they all have ribosomes. In the category of outer protection, everyone has a plasma membrane to keep their insides separate from their outsides. But if you're found in hostile environments like bacteria, or you can't move to escape the elements like plants, you may need additional protection. In the category of mobility, bacteria cells are typically mobile, thanks to flagellin cilia. Certain types of eukaryotic cells do need to be mobile, such as sperm, and would have a flagellum. In eukaryotes, cilia can be used to move stuff around the organism, such as mucus. In the category of organelles, bacteria have no nuclear envelope and no membrane-bound organelles. So, how do the plant and animal cells differ? One of the big differences is how they get their energy. While both plants and animals have mitochondria, these are the only organelle that makes energy for the animal cell. Plants have an additional organelle called a chloroplast, which converts sunlight to energy. Both plant and animal cells need a cytoskeleton to move things around the cell. The Golgi complex tells things where to go, and lysosomes and peroxisomes break stuff down. An endoplasmic reticulum is needed to create and modify proteins and the cell membrane. Plant cells have the addition of a central vacuole, which helps them maintain their internal water pressure. These evolutionary changes in cells occurred over several billion years. Can you imagine the kind of cell changes that might happen over the next several billion? I'm hoping for superpowers personally. Until then, stay tuned and don't forget to like and subscribe.